So when we talk about disruptions, when we talk about you know, emerging tech, you know, changing big industries, fintech, finance, banking always come up very high on the list. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And firstly, we'll start with some intros. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elif, uh, co-founder of Datorate Company. Um, Datorate is a digital analytics and customer engagement platform. Uh, we established the company seven years ago in Turkey, uh, and we are uh, the market make maker, especially in financial institutions, market leader. And after that, we expanded the business in Azerbaijan and in GCC area. And for now, we are uh, started uh, starting to our operation in UK and in Europe. <laughs> Uh, so, in terms of ARR, we are exceeding 5 million for now, and hopefully it will be more by the end of the year. Thank Fantastic. you. Wow. Uh, hi, thanks for having me and, and OpenPaid here today. My name is Michael, uh, Director of Marketing and Business Development at OpenPaid. Um, OpenPaid provides financial infrastructure for digital businesses to move and manage money globally, um, both for themselves and for their, their end users. Uh, and what that looks like practically is we have a single integration uh, for technology businesses to embed accounts, payments, trading into uh, their own infrastructure. Uh, in terms of scale and size, we're 170 people, five different offices, and we process around 130 billion euros every single year. Fantastic. Sean, go for it. Uh, hi, everybody. My name's Sean. I'm out of a Canadian bank called CIBC. Within that bank, we have a software lending group that only lends to scaling software companies, venture growth, and later stages. We landed a European team here uh, three years ago to focus on ARR-based businesses. About a third of our portfolio is some version of fintech. Fintech's obviously massive. Two examples here, many others. And you know, we're hoping to, that we can fund more fintech as it's such a such a large opportunity. Fantastic, great intros. And Sean, we've both been through a lot of innovation cycles in tech, and particularly in fintech. What do you see as the most promising tech at the moment and emerging tech in fintech? Yeah, Jesus, that's a really, really difficult question to yeah. answer because the, the waterfront of fintech is so enormous, whether it's retail banking, wealth banking, or investment banking. And tech for banks and other financial institutions is such a large part of their spend. So the good news is there's always an opportunity or a use case to run at if you have the right uh, domain knowledge to be useful to that institutional set of institutions. As I said, about a third of our funding goes to fintech companies. I, I am very hopeful and positive that AI will be a continual set of transformations for, for the world of fintech and to make financial services better, more efficient and better for the end user as well as the company. Maybe the next two or three questions will get into some of the problems for that. Yeah. But I am very, very optimistic about AI and how it can make fin financial services much better. Excellent. And Eif, um, you're from Turkey. And, you know, I always hear about Turkey disrupting, moving fast, um, sometimes leapfrogging, I don't know, legacy tech. Um, how do you characterize it in banking and what kinds of trends are you seeing in the area? Yeah, absolutely. So the Turkey has always been a leader, mm. especially in banking and fintech innovation. And especially this industry has a strong tradition uh, for adopting digital solutions very early and very easily, very fast. Uh, great examples are mobile banking, online banking, digital transformation and digital everything, actually, especially in the banking industry. Uh, some of the Turkish banks, leader banks, uh, were the first in the region to offer end-to-end -end digital account opening first, mm -hmm. so, uh, and also open banking and in, uh, in the other uh, digital products. But of course, there is a fact behind. There is a population in Turkey. Uh, this population is very young and tech-savvy, uh, and maybe more than half of the population is under the age of 35. Therefore, there is a huge data, there is a huge demand there. Uh, and also, as uh, I know, in the last year, there were a population of more than 100 million mobile application users. Wow. Yeah, it's too much. 
And also in Europe, maybe many European banks are just handling a couple of hundred thousands mobile banking users, but in Turkey, yeah, well. it, is, it is more than 12 million active users in daily basis for, for many banks. So this is the demand in this competitive landscape. Of course, uh, they are needing some solution, but some companies are data rich, but uh, insights poor. Mm. So this is just because of they cannot uh, select the right tools at the right time uh, because uh, they don't make the maybe correct research on it. Mm. So that's why Datoroid exists. Also, that's why we are also a market leader, especially in financial institutions. Uh, we specialize in helping banking industry and fintechs uh, better understand, for better understanding of end user behavior. Yeah, fantastic. And Michael, I mean, embedded finance, banking as a service, these kinds of things are coming up a lot more on our radar at TechEU. So I guess my question would be, what sectors do you see the most traction for these solutions? And where do you sort of differentiate yourself by existing players in the market or incumbents, I guess? Yeah, I, embedded finance is a very broad term, like fintech is, True. so it encapsulates <laughs> insurance, lending, yeah. payments, banking. Um, I think where open pay specialise, it's more on the, the banking and the payment side. Um, and if you look at the history of embedded finance, um, fintechs were one of the early adopters, so using the banking rails, using the banking infrastructure to build their own products and services on top of. Um, now, from fintechs and other licensed financial institutions, we are starting to see increased demand from digital native platforms, whether that is um, transport, whether that's social media, whether that's marketplaces. Um, I think the challenge will always be that everyone wants to launch a financial service, nobody wants to go and get a license. Uh, and that's where players like OpenPay can play their part in terms of being able to offer that service, being able to offer the expertise to the client, as well as the infrastructure they need to, to launch those services. But Personally, I think over the next few years, we'll start to see more uh, on the marketplace and platform side in terms of how do they create a better user experience for their customers when it comes to payments and, and where do they find uh, opportunities to distribute financial services to their end users as well. Yeah, interesting. And I know we, um, the last panel, there was an allusion to um, stablecoin. Like we know the UK is going through some really interesting stuff in this space. For example, Coinbase in February got regulatory approval um, to provide cryptocurrency services in the country. We also saw Bitpanda um, launching, meaning that um, banks and fintechs can offer regulated crypto services. What kind of response are you seeing in the space around this? Uh, we're quite deep in the digital asset space ourselves, mm. so we service um, the majority of major exchanges around the world, whether that's Crypto.com, OKX, um, Bitstamp here in, here in Europe. Um, I think the UK is a really interesting space for a lot of these large exchanges. I think there's 12% adoption across the whole um, population here in the UK, so there's no wonder they want to come and get licensed here. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most interesting things for us as a, a fintech um, operating in the, the banking and payment space is how we can use stable coins um, for cross-border payments. Um, what's most important is, yes, you can have the stable coin products on one side, but you need the on and off ramps for the first mile and the last mile of that transaction. Um, and that's where we see a huge opportunity for businesses like ourselves to support the growth of, uh, of stable coins. But I think it's going to be, I think, regulation uh, around the world. You'll always see that stable coins is their first focus in terms mm -hmm. of trying to push out uh, more clarity around the regulations for that, uh, because I think that's where the utility is for, for the broader, broader uh, kind of tech community. Yeah, interesting. And Sean, how does that play out in tra more traditional banking? <laughs> <laughs> so the world of cryptocurrencies is always very difficult for mainstream banks because you know, we're very wary what the regulators think of what we do in that area. So it's kind of like a semi-verboten area for us to you know, play there. I, I would agree with what Michael said around uh, a lot of uh, new entrants don't want to get licensed because that's very difficult, very cumbersome. And so companies like OpenPay bring a lot of value, a lot of utility, I think, uh, to, 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 the, to the market. I think where, where banks need to focus is improving their customer experience as much as they can, possibly using OpenPay and other sort of product, products like that, and AI, so that the, the a vast amount of new entrants who are really good with a really terrific customer experience. They don't, you know, push uh, banks into more like a pure utility mm. sort, of, sort of function, which is on risk of happening. Mm. So I think um, what um, startups and scale-ups will find is that banks are very interested in new technologies, new propositions that are coming around. That's the good news. And the bad news is 
building those applications into a bank's tech stack takes time, it's problematic, and it's costly. So every company that has a good idea, of which there are plenty, and the banks are receptive, is how fast can you get that connected into the bank or the yeah. financial institution? How fast can you ramp it? And that's really difficult. And we see that two ways, both as an investor and user of new technology, and also as a, as a debt funder into those companies. It's like, you said you were going to be here on your revenue growth plan and you're still there. And it's, it's there, getting that go-to-market right and getting that buyer behavior synced up is, is terribly difficult, terribly important to get right. Mm. What's the timing like for that with procurement cycles? What does it look like? In Do you know, I think it really varies. Yeah, sure. It can be years and you can be years. sat there and growing that. old while uh, wow. you know, companies are still struggling to hit their revenue plan. And that's no criticism of, a, of, of, of anybody, but... Yeah. You know, as you put your business plan together, just check it as, as realistic as you can make it. Cautionary tale, it sounds like. <laughs> but it always depends on the market and the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. So, Elif, I mean, you're looking at data, um, leveraging real-time behavioural data and also things like um, turning that into something meaningful, like, you know, behavioural outcomes for users, um, reducing pain points for customers. What, what kinds of things are you seeing in that space that need to be fixed and how are you fixing them? Um, actually, this is a good question. Thank you for that. Uh, but there are many barriers uh, mm. behind this personalized data-driven uh, personalized experiences. Uh, the first barrier is, of course, the fragmented data. Because, as I mentioned before, there is huge population, there is huge uh, digital penetration for now, and the data is coming from everywhere. Mm. It could be mobile, it could be web. Uh, branch screens, call centers. So if you don't have a centralized data, if you don't have a well-structured data, so it becomes impossible to talk about the decision making on it, on it, especially in real time. So that's the first barrier. But of course, the second one is if you have the data, then how to handle it, uh, how to use it, how to process it. This is another one. Uh, therefore, for personalization, for better experience design, uh, the companies should work on the teams and also the help of maybe Gen AI, uh, predictive AI, uh, to make this data more accessible and more available to several teams internally. It sounds like a plan, absolutely. And um, how does AI factor into this? Like, how are you using that as a tool? I mean, we've spoken about it a little bit today, but where does it come in in an active way in something like your solution? Uh, especially it should be an integrated solution because we are collecting the data, keeping it, making it available for journey analytic and also making it available for real-time mm. touch points such as push, pop-up, any messaging. But in any case, to be more fast, uh, to make it uh, fast, uh, you need to integrate, make the embedded Gen AI and prediction in, on it. Otherwise, you're losing time. Yeah. Our panel users are just looking for the really real-time responses because the population is young, population knows uh, the competition, uh, and they are using banking application maybe for more than five or six applications at the same time. So if you see the potential in the other one, they just make the switch. So therefore, Gen AI, prediction, all disruptive technologies should be ready at the hand Mm. and should be understandable uh, for the internal parties. Yeah, absolutely. And Sean, I mean, obviously you have an investment arm. So how do you look at, I guess, scaling fintechs in terms of funding, when it comes to growth? What kinds of decisions are you sort of prioritising in that? Well, you know, that's a big subject, but I, yeah. I would say our main obsessions are sustainability of the growth. Um, you know, can they keep the growth going for the planning period that, that, that we're looking at? How well funded are they when, when we join? And how likely are they to, to raise again? Obviously, we don't think we're experts and we don't have a crystal ball on stuff like that, but any company that's sort of like three to five of ARR trying to get to 10 to 15, we don't look at that and say, right, you have to have enough money to get to 15. Mm. We just need to see that you've got the right KPIs that would uh, make it a, a reasonable assumption on a reasonable day that that company could raise again in, in, in two years' time. So most of our funding doesn't have a nailed on, and here's the next investor coming around the corner. What we're really sort of uh, betting on, if you like, is that, is that they can get their Series B away, their Series C away. I mean, so far, touch you know, polished whatever this is, uh, we're doing okay. 
Um, and we're, we're seeing that happening more and more across the European uh, territories where, where we're active. And there is a lot of investment money here to, you know, to help, help that, whether it's European funds or North American funds. Mm, interesting. And I guess a question for you, but also Michael, when a bank is, I guess, your buyer or a, you know, a fi financial institution or what have you, um, how do you sell those products like as a startup? Like what matters? Like is, do things factor in like um, your background in terms of if you've worked in, in finance yourself or you've got a you know, history? Like what does it mean for I guess the earlier stage startups in this space? Yeah, I can say. So, I mean, when we're selling into other finance institutions, the, the number one thing that they're looking for is trust and, and resilience of their partner. Um, so are we proven? Are we operating at scale? Mm -hmm. um, do we have the proof points that the product works, um, which, is, uh, which is key? But also, are we as a business growing and innovating at the rate that they are as well? So although they might take some services from us today, um, are we going to be the right partner for them to scale over the next kind of five, uh, five to 10 years? Um, and us as a, as a kind of earliest scale up, um, I think that that roadmap in terms of um, when we're planning on which products that we're going to launch, we grow with our customers. So if we have a, a European client today that's looking to launch um, in um, APAC or they're looking to launch in the US, um, we can align our roadmap with, with theirs um, and, and we can scale with them. So I think it's really important that not just the services that you're looking for today, but the services that are, that are going to be launched in the, in the coming years. Yeah, interesting. And Sean, do you have any thoughts on that? I think just one observation would be just to get the go-to-market right, mm. uh, which often in those types of sales, I think, is the people themselves and that they have, you know, really strong domain knowledge of whatever product or services is that they're pushing because getting that go-to-market right as your ARR goes north of, say, three to five, it's so important. It's what Because they should have product market fit at that point and the go-to-market people just really carry the business so it's so important at, at that point, and I'm not saying it's easy to get, you know, really good enterprise sales people. It's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I guess one thing that always comes up is this idea that, you know, we have legacy tech and we have incumbent tech. You know, how can a startup actively ease the transition? And maybe you, you might have some thoughts to start with, Michael. So in terms of them using the legacy tech? Uh, yeah, uh, um, or getting, you know, making making sense of the two in a way that's, you know, useful for the, the end product? Yeah, look, I think that um, any, any, if you're a startup, then one of the main things that you should be looking at is are you use, using the, the latest services, the latest tools, um, mm. and trying to protect yourself on, on the longer term uh, from that. Now, inevitably, um, it's not always easy. It's not always the case. And also, as a startup, you don't always have ex access to some of those larger, more innovative businesses. But uh, I think it's making sure that you're building technology, building platform that is going to be able to stand the test of time. Um, over uh, over the period that you're looking at and not just trying to get to your next raise or not just trying to get to which unfortunately sometimes happens. Yeah. What's your experience with that, Sean? So uh, one observation that we have had trying to bring on new technology is trying to get the stuff plugged into our tech stack and get yeah. the internal tech people to go, yeah, that's okay and we can do that and it can happen you know, before hell freezes over and it's not going to cost a ridiculous amount of money. I found that the very hard balance to get, um, we were trying to get some a deposit software that could allow us to reach new markets with a simple deposit taking product. It just cost too much money. But the, 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 th the thing that broke the, the camel's back was the integration costs. The actual standalone cost of the product was actually pr pretty good. Oh, we just gosh. couldn't afford the integration. And I think people need to weigh up the risk of migrating over to, uh, or the cost of migrating over to new technology. Um, and the risk of sticking with your legacy uh, technology over that period of time, because I think on the, over the longer term, it makes sense to, to, to migrate. Yeah, that, that's, that involves, I guess, a, a lot of different people making decisions in a company when, you know, one person might be focused on their, their champion within a company, but they might not be the, the financial controller. Huh? Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Do you have any final thoughts around this, given you're creating and providing that technology? Yeah, you know? sure, but yeah, actually my answer is also the same, uh, just to, to mm. make the scale globally, especially you should be cloud agnostic, infrastructure agnostic and tech uh, agnostic. And in parallel, privacy matters. And as a data analytics platform, we are also focusing on the regulation. Uh, specifically in each market. Mm -hmm. So there are many barriers, there are many challenges, but also in parallel, of course, there are many opportunities. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, panel, for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure and a joy. And um, yeah, 
Thank you, everybody, for listening and participating. Thank you.